Good evening and welcome to Ajahn Brahm Live. <laughs> you just heard the tape recordings, but this is a real thing. So hopefully you're nice and comfortable. And we'll start another Dhamma talk. I don't know how many Dhamma talks I've given in the last, in the years I've been a monk. Sometimes it's more than one a day, two, three a day, 365 days a year. There's thousands of talks. And still people come and hear it. <laughs> so always got to try and think of something new. Try and think of a different way of expressing the beautiful teachings of the Buddha. And for this evening's talk, it's going to be about the five hindrances, but especially how they relate to the way you look at life. And uh, the way I'm going to teach this evening is going to be very helpful for all you meditators but it's also going to be very helpful for those of you who aren't meditating, who have to live in the world, living life, because this is how you deal with the events of life, whether it's events which happen while you're meditating or whether it's what happens just when you're out there in the world. The point is, it's not what you experience which is a problem, it's how you experience it. That's the problem. And I'm going to start with the yogis who have been meditating here because sometimes you've been doing all sorts of things during this meditation. And sometimes you come to me in the interviews and say, oh, it's terrible, my mind is doing this and my mind is doing that. And I always say, have you ever noticed? I say, oh, that's good, that's excellent. <laughs> and I do that on purpose because there's nothing you can't use in life to gain enlightenment. Everything is useful. Which is why that when you are, say, have got a restless mind, you say, oh wonderful, thank you mind for being restless. You embrace it. You have this wonderful loving kindness which you've heard me say, oh, the door of my heart is open to you no matter what you are like. It's called metta, loving kindness. The opposite of that is called ill will, where you say, mind, if you are peaceful, if you behave yourself, then I'll like you. Otherwise, you awful mind, you hopeless mind, you stupid mind, I must be the worst meditator in this whole retreat. Actually, as many people have come and thought they were the worst meditator in this whole retreat, there can't be, everyone can't be a worse meditator. It's just like the old, here's a nice little, uh, to so just how, wishful thinking and deceit, how ill will bend the truth. Now I want you to be absolutely honest here. To ask yourself, do you think you are above average intelligence or below average intelligence? If you think you're above average intelligence, put your hand up. Go on, be honest. <laughs> Now the point is, about 99% of people in this room think they're above average intelligence. Isn't that right? But you can't all be above average intelligence. <laughs> average intelligence means half of you have to be below, be below average intelligence and half of you are above. But the point is, it's wishful thinking, the way we look at life bends the truth. Because we don't like to be below average intelligence, we bend the truth. And this is what the hindrances are all about. It's not what we're seeing, what we're experiencing, what we're knowing is a problem, it's how we are knowing it. We don't accept it, we don't open the door of our heart to it, we want to get rid of it, we want to make it something different. That's the problem in life. For example, there was a lot of kids here this evening. Welcome kids. Sometimes, you know what it's like at the end of the year when you get your report? Sometimes the report's not that good. And sometimes you get very afraid. Hello. <laughs> it's not what you do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But it's not what you experience is the problem, it's how you experience it. So if somebody comes up in front of my, my face with a camera, I just enjoy myself, who cares? <laughs> now, back to your examinations. 
Sometimes you children, when you do your examinations, have, have you ever come bottom of the class? Someone has to come bottom of the class. So it's not coming bottom or top which is a problem, it's how you deal with it. That's the problem. So when I was a school teacher, for one year I was a school teacher, and I tell, if you teach children in the West, you know how hard it is, how indisciplined the children are in the West. Have you ever seen Western schools? Oh, you can't tell the children to do anything. You can't cane them, you can't do anything. They've got their rights. The teacher's got no rights. <laughs> so if you teach in a high school in the West, it's enough to make anyone want to leave the world and become a monk or a nun. <laughs> oh, it's so hard. But anyway, in my class, at the end of the year, there was one boy who came 30th. There were 30 children in the class. And so when he gave the reports out, he came 30th. There had to be one child who came 30th, and it happened to be him. And when he opened up his report card, you can see he looked so depressed, so upset, so miserable. He had to take that report card to his parents and, whoa, I don't know what they would do. And so he looked just so unhappy. And even then I was a Buddhist. So because I was a Buddhist school teacher, I thought, now there's suffering out of compassion. I've got to help this kid. So I went up to the kid and I taught him some Buddhism. Actually, it was Mahayana Buddhism I taught him about the Bodhisattva. Because I said that a Bodhisattva is someone who abandons his own happiness for the sake of others. And I said, now that's what you have just done. <laughs> you have abandoned your own happiness and you sacrificed yourself by taking this awful position of coming 30th in the class because you're concerned that no one else, all your friends, don't have to have that ignominy and that shame of coming last in the class. You are so caring and compassionate for others to take the awful position so no one else has to. You are like a bodhisattva. You deserve a medal. You are the most compassionate and kind person in this whole class of 30 because you've come bottom so no one else has to. He thought I was crazy. <laughs> But the point was he laughed and that took away his depression. And in the next year, someone else was the bodhisattva of the class. <laughs> so if there's any school, any school teachers here, the kid who comes the 30th, now that is an incipient bodhisattva. <laughs> Someone who sacrifices themselves for others. <laughs> so the point was, it's not coming bottom of the class which is the problem. It's how you deal with it. Your attitude towards that event in your life. Now the Buddha taught these five hindrances. And for those of you who have heard these five hindrances before, just have a think of them again. What is it? It's desire, usually sensory desire, ill will, sloth and torpor, restlessness and remorse and doubt. That's nothing concerned with what you are experiencing, it's all how you experience it. What you're experiencing, have you got desire for it? Do you want it? Are you trying to crave for it and hold on to it? You, what you experience is that you, something you don't want. So sloth and torpor is just when you, sort of, you don't want it and you just blank out, restlessness and worry, where you can't be content with what you've got, you always want to go somewhere else. And doubt is you don't know what you're doing. You can't understand what's happening. It's all nothing to do with what you're experiencing. It's all to do with how you're, uh, you are experiencing life. That's all. So all of you meditators, it doesn't matter what is going on in your mind right now. What is the content of your consciousness? What's most important is what you're doing about it. It's the same for people in the lay world. For example, if you feel depressed, it's not that depression is a problem, it's actually how you deal with depression. That's the problem. So my advice, if you're depressed, enjoy it. 
Say depression, come, more please. Because there's a lot of advantages when you're depressed. You don't have to go to work. You can stay in bed all day. You don't have... <laughs> so the point being is the reason why depression gets deeper is because we don't like to be depressed. We have ill will towards depression. A lot of times depression is just tiredness. The poor mind has been working very hard. It's been disappointed in life. It's got no energy. It's got no oomph inside of it. And what do we do? We get depressed about being depressed. And we get even more tired, more depressed. Which is why that anyone who knows depression knows it's a spiral. You go deeper and deeper, digging your own hole as you try to struggle out. So if someone comes depressed, and they come to me and say, what's wrong with being depressed? It's not against the five precepts. I haven't heard the Buddha say, you know, depression where Ramanisi Karpadang Sabadi Army. Now when I say that, what happens is because they feel at ease with being depressed, the depression lifts. They're making peace with it. They're not fighting it. They're not adding ill will towards their depression. So they're not feeding it. And then they find that depression lifts. The depression is just part of life. There are some times when things go so out of control and things go wrong. They don't go wrong. Everything goes right in life. All about cause and effect. But we say it goes wrong. What about when you're sick? What do you do when you get sick? When you go to the, see the doctor, what do you say? You say, there's something wrong with me, doctor. I'm sick. What a silly thing to say. Hands up anyone here who has never been sick. So you have all been sick, or you're deaf, one of the two. <laughs> the question. You've all been sick. Actually, it would be very strange, it would be very abnormal if you weren't sick from time to time. Isn't that correct? In fact, there'd be something very wrong if you were never sick. So actually, if you get sick, it's right. So the next time you feel sick and you go to see the doctor, please be honest, please be a Buddhist, please be wise and tell that doctor, doctor, there's something right with me, I'm sick again. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with being sick. It's not the sickness, it's the way we look at it, the attitude we have towards it. I don't want to be sick. That's the problem. In all of these cases, it's not what you experience in life, it's how you experience it is the problem. All of you meditators here, you've been meditating here for, what's it, three days already? You've got six days to go. Some of you will start to experience boredom. You get bored. Here we go. Get up in the morning, do the chanting, do the meditation, same old breakfast, same old talk. Sitting, walking, sitting, walking. My God, more sitting, more walking. Can't we do something different? You get bored. Now, this is what you should do with boredom. Boredom is one of the most interesting subjects. When you're bored, find out, has it got any feelings in the body of boredom? Where is actually this boredom? Is it actually a feeling of heat or a pain or aching anywhere in the body? When is bored? Does it actually get intense bored, medium bored or light bored? Does it actually change throughout the day? You know, there's different sort of intensities of boredom. And actually, what makes a boredom change? What makes it go to really deep boredom? And what makes it only medium, medium bored? And is boredom infectious? Do you catch it from the person sitting next to you? <laughs> Make a study of boredom. And actually, boredom becomes an interesting subject. In fact, it gets so interesting to investigate boredom you find you're not bored at all anymore. <laughs> the point is that it's a negativity to life which makes us bored. It's not life, it's how we look at it. It's the same with happiness. Some people look at this meditation retreat and say, 
nothing's going on. I am not happy. Or you look at your breath and think, it's a boring breath. It's not the breath which is boring, it's you who's boring. (laughs) So you put energy, you put happiness, the way you look at it, you meditate with passion. Whatever you do. You see, when I give a talk, I talk with passion. I'm a passionate Dhamma speaker, passionate Brahm. But it's not the passion you think about, it's compassion. <laughs> so what you're doing there is you're putting energy into what you're doing. And when you put energy, life, into what you're doing, the whole world wakes up. Why? Because you wake up. It's how you look at life. That's the problem. So, even if you have difficulties in life, even if there's problems, even if you've had great tragedies, you've lost a loved one to death, your business has all gone wrong, you're bankrupt, you're about to die, or your children are playing around, it doesn't matter what you're experiencing, it's how you experience it is the problem. So, You've known this simile before, I hope, because I say this very often. When rotten things happen to you in life, it's like walking along the road and stepping in the dog poo. You get dog poo over your shoes. Next time you step in the dog poo, when things go wrong, instead of complaining and moaning, you should say, Whoopee! I've got some dog poo for my mango tree. And you take that shoe back home, you scrape it off under the mango tree, you wash it off under the mango tree, and all that wonderful dog poo fertilizer goes into the roots, up the tree, and into the mango. And the next time you eat the mango from your tree, the reason why it's sweet is because the dog poo. (laughs) That's, That's how we deal with the dog poo of life. We dig it in, into our life, we learn from it, and that's why life is sweet. That's where our happiness comes from. We've made use of life. So nothing, not even the smelliest, dirtiest, rubbishy, horrible of experiences of life, there's nothing needs to be rejected. My monastery in Australia is in a eucalypt forest. There is a disease which has been in that forest for many, many years called Jarrah dieback. So some of the Jarrah trees actually die because they've got a fungus underneath. When I first came to that forest, I looked at that forest and there was a number of dead trees. And I thought, let's get all the dead trees out of the way, cut them down so the new trees can grow, grow so we can have this beautiful, healthy forest. And somebody said, stop, don't do that. And they explained to me, and what they said was true, I've seen this over the years I've lived there. The dead trees are important. Because it's in the hollows of the dead trees inside, that's where the possums live. These little marsupials, like a little cat uh, for Australia. It's in the hollows where the branches break off, where the birds nest. There's so many animals depend upon those dead trees. And when they told me how important are the dead trees to the forest in Australia, I realized, no, those trees have to stay. They too are valuable. I learned from that experience, when you look at a forest, the trees which you think are ugly, which are useless, which are unimportant, actually are sometimes the most valuable. Every tree is important in the forest. In the same way, every experience of your life is also so valuable. You don't just select, these are the nice trees, I'll keep these, and you get rid of the unpleasant trees. You don't just choose the beautiful experiences in life. All experiences in life are there for a purpose. You welcome everything. They're all essential to you. What that means, 
the unpleasant experience the unpleasant experiences in life, you stop looking at them in a negative way. Instead, you embrace them, you learn from them, you grow from them, and this is how you become wise, compassionate, even enlightened. You don't throw away anything. It's not the experiences of life which are the problem, it's how you deal with them. Take away the loss of a loved one. Sometimes we say, oh, I wish that hadn't have happened. Sometimes it's hard to bear, you think. But it's not the loss which is the problem. It's the way you look at it. Are you looking at that with ill will? I don't want this. Why did it happen to me? That is the problem. Your reaction to the difficulties of life. In the same way, those of you who have had difficulties in your meditation... Oh, I'm tired, my body is aching, I'm sleepy. It doesn't matter if you're sleepy, it's how you react to that sleepiness which is the problem. It's a Zen story. The founder of one of the great traditions of Zen, Lin Chi, otherwise known as Rinzai, he was meditating in the Zendo with all the other monks. Now, those meditation retreats were tough, not like Ajahn Brah meditation <laughs> because the teacher would come around with this big stick and if anyone was not sitting absolutely dead straight, they'd whack them on the back with the stick. Have you ever been to any of those retreats? Cowards. <laughs> I went, when I was young, I went to a retreat like that when I was a student. And in the morning, I was very tired. I was trying my hardest actually to sit up straight, especially when the guy came with the stick. But I was very lucky. I had good karma because I wasn't the most sleepy. There was another guy who beat me just by a, a little bit. He was the most sleepy and he was sitting next to me so he got hit first. And as soon as he got hit and I heard the sound, I was fully awake. <laughs> It really wakes you up to hearing somebody else being hit. <laughs> but there was Rinzai nodding. His head was almost down to the floor. And the master came in. And the monk next to him elbowed him. The master's come in. Straighten up. And Rinzai, he opened one eye. Only one eye. He was very lazy. He opened one eye and said, oh, it's only him and closed his eye and carried on sleeping. And the master exploded. He scolded and he shouted and he said, all you monks in here, you don't know anything about Buddhism. There's only one good monk in here. That's Rinzai. See, he's letting go. Good on you. <laughs> he praised the sleeping monk. Just as I do. When you're sleeping, at least you're letting go. You let it go a bit too much, but at least you're letting go of something. <laughs> and for those of you sitting in the back who haven't heard these stories, it was the monks who let go. It's actually Sa Mogalana, Maha Mogalana, one of the two chief disciples of the Buddha. He was also into sleepiness. When he started meditating, he would nod. And the Buddha came to see him and gave him some advice. But he was the one who got sloth and torpor. And a week later, he was fully enlightened and arahat with all the psychic powers. So if I see anyone here sleepy, I think, you have got great potential. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the sleepiness which is a problem. It's how we react to it. Sometimes you are embarrassed about being sleepy. You are so proud that you wouldn't dare sort of falling asleep and snoring in front of everybody. That's why if you've got the guts to do that, at least I know that your ego is very small and you're very close to understanding anatta. 
But if you're so conceited and proud, you don't want to do that. That's the problem, your conceit, your pride. There's nothing wrong with being sleepy. It's, it's got causes. Sometimes you didn't have a good sleep last night. Maybe you got really inspired and you meditated late at night. And this is a karmic result. It's nothing to do with you. It's just the body, that's all. Sometimes it's your rhythms in the body. Sometimes it's the food. Sometimes it's the heat, the cold. Sometimes, as someone was saying in the interview time, because it's Monday, on Monday you get negative. It's just your weekly cycle because you have to go to work. <laughs> There's all sorts of causes. So when you recognize the causes, it's nothing to do with you. So leave it alone. Just be mindful of being sleepy and let it go. Don't have ill will to being sleepy. It's old karma. You're sleepy. Now what karma are you doing now about your sleepiness? If you're fighting it with ill will, then of course it's bad karma for the future. Of course, that's not going to work. If you're sleepy, you have to be at peace with that sleepiness. Let it go. Be at ease with it. It's not me being sleepy, it's just the mind, cause and effect, that's all. So don't fight. The way we look at life is to make peace with things. I know this through bitter experience. I too was a nodder when I was a young monk. I used to have a lot of time a lot of trouble fighting my sleepiness. Now looking back at it, it was obvious why I was sleepy. The food I ate in northeast Thailand was just so poor. You were thin, you didn't have enough energy, you had to get up really early in the morning. There was no air cons in those days. You used to sit in the hot jungles, it was humid, mosquitoes were biting you, it was so unpleasant. I wasn't used to that. No wonder I was sleepy, but I tried to fight it. I tried all sorts of things. One thing which I did was actually you get a matchbox, take off the lid and put the matchbox on top of your head. So that if you start nodding, the matchbox falls off and everyone hears it. It worked, sort of, because after a while I could sit there and the matchbox never fell off. And I thought, aha, I beat my sleepiness. Until somebody came up, one of the other monks, and said, Ajahn Brahm, I want to talk to you about something. I, I open my eyes, I see why that matchbox hasn't fallen off. You're still sleepy, but when you start nodding, now you start nodding like this. <laughs> it was true. <laughs> It's so hard. <laughs> and when you did fight and you got through the sleepiness, the next thing which happened, you're always restless. And so I was yo-yoing between being sleepy and being restless. You calm down the restless, then you'd be sleepy, then you'd be restless, then you'd be sleepy. I could never find that middle way when you're just so peaceful, alert, but without being restless. And I realized why. After many, many years, and I give this teaching so that you don't have to waste all the time I wasted. You're putting forth so much effort, you're fighting the sleepiness. When you get through the sleepiness, you've got too much energy, you're controlling, you will always have restlessness. If instead you make peace with the sleepiness, you don't fight it, you make peace with it. It doesn't last all that long. When it finishes, you're left with the peace. Not the fighting, not the ego, not the pride. You're left with this beautiful humility. This is the nature of the body. Leave it alone. It goes all by itself. And when you're left, let them leave. Sleepiness is gone. You've got this beautiful peace. You can get into lovely meditations afterwards. That is how to get rid of sleepiness. You've also, that's the third or fourth hindrance, third hindrance. The first hindrance is desire. How many of you are trying to get the nimitta? Desire, 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 desire. 
How many of you want to get jhanas? How many of you want to get enlightened? There's only a few days to go. You better be quick. This is the called desire. The Buddha called it the hindrance, the first hindrance. Isn't that plain? You shouldn't want anything. Whatever you're experiencing it, exper- whatever you experience, experience it without any desire in meditation. That's why we say this is good enough. This is good enough. This is good enough. It means no desire. I used that as a meditation for many years. I just said to myself, no desire, no desire, no desire. Whatever I experienced, that was good enough. I didn't want anything else. It was wonderful when you let go of desires. You get content. I don't want anything. When you don't want thing, anything, what's left? Contentment, peace. When you don't want anything, for many, many minutes, that contentment gets stronger and stronger and stronger. That peace builds up until it gets so intense, that contentment, that peace, turns into this beautiful limiter which goes straight into jhanas, which leaves you enlightened afterwards. Contentment, peace. Wasn't the Buddha striving for six years and never got anywhere? And when he gave up, he got everywhere, any, everywhere he wanted. I usually tell this story towards the end of the retreat in case anyone is really desperate to get enlightened at the last minute. (laughs) But I'm going to tell it now because it fits in. In the time of the Buddha, there was a nun called Siha. She'd been a nun for seven years, a bhikkhuni, in a great monastery in the time of the Buddha with the greatest of teachers, Seven years and she never got any samadhi at all. Not even a moment of peace. That's the time of the Buddha. So does that make you feel, oh, I'm not so bad then. (laughs) (laughs) But after seven years, a seven year retreat, when she had no peace, she couldn't meditate even after seven years with the greatest of teachers. It makes me feel good as well because when the Buddha was around, if he was teaching and still people couldn't get meditation and I feel not so bad when people don't get meditation under me. (laughs) But (laughs) in the end she got desperate. She had no peace in her monastic life. She didn't want to disrobe and go back to the world. So there was only one alternative. She took a length of rope She went into the forest. She climbed a tree. She tied one end of the rope onto the tree, the other around her neck. She was just about to jump off when she became enlightened. That was a close thing. I don't recommend it to you. (laughs) But the point is, why did that happen? Because when she was about to jump off, she was really letting go. She wasn't trying anymore. She wasn't trying to become peaceful. She gave up. She gave in. She surrendered. She let go. Her ego, herself, disappeared. And she got peaceful and still so quickly, just in time. (laughs) Phew, that was a close one. And the same thing happened to Ananda, the Buddha's chief disciple, uh, uh, chief attendant. He was with the Buddha for about 20 years as his attendant. It was only the last 20 years he was the attendant. Earlier before that there was other attendants. Or 25 years, however, it was a long time. He'd listened to all these amazing teachings. He'd been sitting next to the Buddha and people coming up, becoming stream winners, once returners, non-returners, arahats. There come some more people becoming enlightened. Imagine what it was like sitting next to the Buddha for all that time and he hadn't got anything. He'd been a stream winner but no more than that. And then the Buddha died and he thought, oh my goodness, if I can't get enlightened when the Buddha's alive, what hope is there for me now? But a few months later, the monks decided to have a council to get all of the the best monks together (coughs) so they can get all the teachings in one place Record them all for posterity. It was called the First Council. 
So they decide to invite 500 monks. 499 were fully enlightened. Arahats, perfect ones. And the odd one out was Ananda. Imagine that was you. Imagine it was the last day of the retreat. And I made the announcement that of the 120 people or whatever is in this retreat, everyone was fully enlightened except for you. <laughs> How would you feel? Oh, that hurts. And that's what Ananda felt. Tomorrow he was going to have a meeting with 499 Arahats and he wasn't. So this was it. He was going to meditate all night. Give it everything he got. Enlightenment or bust. No messing around. No sloppy business. No cups of coffee or anything like that. Fully on. <laughs> and he meditated like... Meditated and meditated and meditated. The harder he meditated, the worse it got. Just like you. <laughs> <laughs> How many of you have been trying so hard and saying, it doesn't work, it doesn't work, of course it doesn't work, you're supposed to be letting go, not trying. So, he meditated and meditated and it got to dawn. And he was probably further from enlightenment, he thought, than he ever was before. So what did he do? He gave up. He completely gave up. And he decided just to take a little nap. Before his head hit the pillow, he was an arahat. Fully enlightened. He let go. Gave up. No desire. I've been telling you that all the time. Think, oh, if I give up and have no desire, everything will go wrong. It doesn't go wrong. Everything goes right. You make peace. Peace upon peace upon peace means you get this huge amount of peace. You're content. You have no desires. Isn't that wonderful? Listen, when I was a young monk in Thailand, you know, you're not allowed to have money as a monk. You can't have personal money. But one thing you can do, I'm going to tell you this, but I'm going to ask you afterwards, please don't do this. What you can do, if a monk gives a service for you and you want to show your appreciation, you can go up to him and say, Ajahn Brahm, you know, it's really good what you've just done for me. I really appreciate it. Can, can I get something you want? Please let me know what you want. And usually you say how much you, know, you have. Now what can I get you for say 30 ringgit or 100 ringgit? Because you've got to say the price otherwise you may only need mean 10 ringgit and I really want a, a, something like a, a new retreat centre which costs a few million or <laughs> something. So you usually tell the price. So this man, I'd helped him I forget why I helped him. He was very grateful. He said, Ajahn Brahm, I really, really helped me. Anything I can get you for a hundred baht. Which was quite a bit of money. I think it's about three dollars now, but in those days it was worth a lot of money. So he said, what can I get you for a hundred baht? Now I was very content before he asked me that. And actually I couldn't think of anything I needed. And he was in a bit of a hurry, as people usually are. So I said, look, I can't really think at the moment. Can you come back tomorrow? And he was going to come back tomorrow anyway. And I said, I'll tell you then what I want for 100 baht. And I said, okay, fine. So I went back to my hut, got out a piece of paper and started thinking what I needed. <laughs> After five minutes, 100 baht wasn't enough. <laughs> and it was strange because all the things which I never thought I wanted before, now they were absolutely necessary. I couldn't take anything off the list. And, before, and another ten minutes, and I, the other side was filled up with things I wanted. Even a thousand baht wouldn't be enough now. And if I'd have gone any longer, even a hundred thousand baht wouldn't be enough. As soon as my started wanting, it had no end. So what I had to do, I tore up the paper, threw it in the bin. And when he came back tomorrow, I said, the next day I said, look, give it to the monastery. Please never do that to me again. <laughs> <laughs> when I had no money, I had no wants because I couldn't get anything anyway. 
God is so peaceful. Now do you understand what desire is? When I didn't have any means? When I didn't have any means, I was free from wanting. I had everything I wanted, which was nothing. Isn't that wonderful? To have everything you ever want, which was nothing. Now that is what enlightenment is. Freedom from want. When all your wants are fulfilled. How can you fulfill all your wants? By having no wants. Then you want for nothing. Are you a person who wants for nothing? That has a double meaning, doesn't it? To want for nothing, you should say they're so rich they want for nothing. I want for nothing. Give me nothing. (laughs) That's what I want, nothing. That means contentment, that means ultimate wealth. A person's ultimately wealthy, they want for nothing. I want for nothing, therefore I must be ultimately wealthy. Now isn't this an idea of how to get to enlightenment, how to get to peace? Want for nothing. Give up your desires, your craving. How can you get peace and depth in meditation when you want to get something? I want to be mindful. I want to be peaceful. I want to follow my breath. I want, 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 want. Suffering, 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 suffering. (laughs) So try wanting for nothing. It's like, because I've mentioned all these wonderful stages of meditation, I've mentioned nimittas and jhanas, I've mentioned even psychic power, seeing your past lives. Before I mentioned those things, you were like me as a young monk. You know, when somebody said, there's nothing on offer, I didn't want for anything. It's like I've given you a hundred baht, what do you want for a hundred baht? And you say, jhanas, nimittas, in life. <laughs> Stop wanting things, throw that away and just be content. The only thing to want is not wanting. To be content. The only thing to desire is the end of desire. You're meditating for peace. You're not meditating to attain something. You're meditating to get rid of things, not to get things. You're meditating to abandon not to accumulate more possessions. There's something in Buddhism we call spiritual materialism. Just like you accumulate goods in the world, you accumulate a big bank balance, a nice car, a big house and a wonderful family, so that some monks or nuns, yogis, like to accumulate experiences. How many times have you got nimitas? Oh, that's nothing, I've got it more than you. How many... (laughs) I've got first John. Oh, that's nothing. I've got second John. Anyone can do first John. I've got, nah, that's nothing. I've got third. <laughs> it's spiritual materialism. Trying to accumulate things, like degrees. I've told everyone on this retreat, at the end of this retreat, I do not give a report card. You do not get graded. A, B, C, D, E, and F. Which one is you? F, go on. <laughs> There is no F grades in this, this um, retreat. In this retreat, you are accepted for who you are. You're at peace with who you are. Every moment you accept fully. The door of my heart's open to this moment. Be at peace with this. You're not trying to get anywhere. You're trying to be where you are. So, stop all this desiring business. I want to get somewhere else. I want to get rid of my restless mind. I want to get rid of all these thoughts. I want to get rid of this pain. I want, I want, I want. You just get more and more crazy. And then when you get crazy, you come to me in the interview time and I've got to deal with your craziness. (laughs) So out of compassion, please give up for me. Please give up all this wanting business. Now, for those of you sitting in the back there, this doesn't apply to you in your life. This is only for meditation. In your life, you've got to want. You've got to work hard. 
You've got to do your business and make your money. Otherwise, monks like me would never get any young pal. <laughs> no, I don't mean that. It all goes for the monasteries anyway. I don't get anything. No, you've got to be able to work to do your business. And as I said yesterday, there is a time to want to put everything you to put effort into whatever you're getting. But when it comes to meditation, that's the time to rest, to do nothing, to go in the opposite direction, to go against the stream of craving. It takes courage to do that. Huge trust, faith and courage. But please know that's what the Buddha did. There's a saying that the Buddha, he crossed the stream without striving, he said. It's one of the, one of the, I forget where it actually is. One of the monks was talking to me about it before I left. Without um, going to the left or the right, without going upstream, without going downstream, without bridging the stream, without striving, I crossed it. Very profound. It means when you're still, when you stop, when you let go, when you stop all this craving business, everything falls into place. Peace upon peace upon peace. You become still. You find this meditation is easy. When the penny drops and you get the trick, you can relax so easily. You don't do anything. Peace comes to you. You don't go to peace. To actually, to, to give you another simile, this is one of my famous similes. Again, this is original to Ajahn Brahm, patented. <laughs> it's the simile of how the donkey catches the carrot. Now, this simile, if you have been to southern Europe, you would understand this simile. Because in those countries, years ago, they used to travel by donkey cart. And they used to carry their goods by donkey carts. Now, since Buddhism came to southern Europe, you don't see donkey carts anymore. Because when the donkeys learn Buddhism, they learn how to catch the, catch the carrots. Because what they used to do, they used to put a stick on the back of the car or the back of the donkey. The stick protruded about two feet in front of the donkey's head. On the end of the stick was a string. On the end of the string was a nice juicy carrot. Because donkeys were notoriously stubborn. If you beat them, shouted at them, they would never move. But if you dangled a carrot in front of them, yeah, they'd move for that. And so they'd see a carrot in front of them. So they'd move forward for the carrot. But of course, because they had a stick tied to their back and the carrot was on the end of the stick, when they moved forward, so did the carrot. And that way, the donkeys followed the carrot and they pulled the cart and they could go to the destination where the owner wanted. That's like the donkey carts with the carrot. You understand? Now, when Buddhism went to southern Europe, the donkeys, when they learned Buddhism, that trick never worked anymore. <laughs> The donkeys learn how to catch the carrot and now I'm going to teach you how to catch the carrot. What does a Buddhist donkey do? He runs like hell after that carrot. You've already been doing that already. You, you, you've done that part. Chasing the carrot as fast as you can. Now, ordinary donkeys can do that. Christian donkeys, Muslim, atheist donkeys, but... The Buddhist donkey knows how to stop. So the donkey's going as fast as it possibly can and then the donkey suddenly stops, let go. What happens when you stop? That carrot goes further away. Which is what happens when you let go, your mind looks like it's going even more crazy. You get even more sleepy. You think you're getting nowhere. But the Buddhist donkey has faith. Have faith, come on, please. <laughs> Let go. Because the carrot goes so far away and you think you're going absolutely crazy, this is a hopeless retreat, you're not getting anything, that carrot of peace, happiness, wisdom, insight is even further away than it's ever been before. But then a magical thing happens. As long as you don't move, as long as you keep the faith and be still, 
that carrot starts to come towards you. And it's amazing. You don't have to do anything. You're not chasing the carrot. Now the carrot is chasing you. And it comes to its normal position, about two feet in front of you, just your normal state of mind. But this time it's coming towards you at top speed. (laughs) Peace, joy, insights, enlightenment is coming towards you. And what do you have to do? All you have to do when the carrot comes so close is say, Carrot, the door of my mouth is open to you. (laughs) Come in. Got it. And then you're enlightened. Easy. So, that's what we mean by letting go. You've been working hard enough already. Now let go. Sure enough, you think when you let go of craving, all the mind gets even more crazy. That's just a carrot going a little bit further. Wait. Hold still. Don't interrupt the process and the enlightenment will come towards you. Some of you experience that already. You're sitting here, you let go. It gets crazy for a while. And then it starts to stop. And it gets peaceful. The present moment is easy. The mind is silent. You get beautiful breath. And nimitta comes up so easily. Wham, bam, you're in. That is how you overcome that first hindrance of desire. The second hindrance is our ill will. Of all the hindrances, that is the worst. Because all of you have got so much ill will towards yourself. Sometimes towards me as well. (laughs) It's very tough (laughs) being about, oh, when is that? I'm going to stop. It's okay for him, but not for us. Sometimes you give a talk and it's, come on, it's nine o'clock. Can't we finish? I want to meditate. I want to go sneak off and go back. When all the lights are on, I can see everybody here who's sneaking off and who's staying here. Oh, sometimes you get ill will. Now the problem with ill will, it doesn't make matters easier. It only makes matters harder. If you have ill will especially to your mind, stupid mind, come on. Watch the breath. If you have ill will towards the mind, what happens? The mind gets even more crazy. I've already said the mind goes on strike. For those of you who've got children, if the child is upset or is not feeling well or is scared, and you put it to bed at night, and it can't sleep, and you have to go and help your kid go to sleep, what do you do? Do you look at that child and say, get to sleep, or else? Do you grab it by the throat, I warn you, you better go to sleep. (laughs) Do you think the child will go to sleep that way? No. You've got to be kind to that child. Dear child, Kind child, I'll tell you a little story. And if you're gentle and you stroke your child, you'll feel so comfortable, it will soon go to sleep. That's how you calm your child. That's how you calm yourself. If you've got a crazy mind, oh dear mind, calm down. Everything's all right. Ajahn Brahm is here. You're so <laughs> <laughs> I told a story today about the Malagiri meditation strategy. Have you heard that one yet? This is another original patented Ajahn Brahm story. <laughs> Many of you, when you were young, going to Dharma school as a child, or you may have heard this when you took your own child to the Dharma school, you'd hear one of the episodes in the life story of the Buddha called Nalagiri. What happened, this was one of the assassination attempts against the Buddha. They, I think they gave this elephant a lot of alcohol and he went absolutely crazy. He was a mad, raging elephant and they let him loose along the road where the Buddha and the monks were coming on arms round. And all the monks, when the people said, there's a wild elephant coming this way, get out of the way, hide. 
All the monks except two ran away. Actually, some of the monks climbed up trees. <laughs> but the two monks were the Buddha and his faithful, devoted disciple Ananda, who stood in front of the Buddha. Take me rather than the Buddha. It was one of these noble acts of sacrifice. Absolutely useless, but noble nevertheless. <laughs> So the Buddha kind of, get out of the way, Ananda, it's all right, I can deal with this. (laughs) So there he was. It was like high noon, Nalagiri versus the Buddha. And there was this huge elephant charging down the road at this helpless monk. Now, what did the Buddha do? The Buddha had huge psychic abilities. He was a powerful monk. If he wanted to, he could have caught Nalagiri by the trunk, swirled him around his head three times, <laughs> and thrown him over the Ganges. Just like if Superman can do that, the Buddha, the original super monk, could do even better. <laughs> but did he do that? Did he fight force with force? No he started spreading loving kindness. Kind elephant, dear elephant, if you trample me, that's all right. The door of my heart will be open to you. If you want to pick me up in your trunk and throw me around, that's fine too. I'll give you forgiveness. You know, sometimes people ask forgiveness of me. I'm getting so tired of people asking forgiveness of me. It takes up so much of my... I'm a very busy monk. These days I give people forgiveness for the three time zones. You come to me and ask forgiveness. I give you forgiveness for everything you've done by body, speech and mind, intentional or unintentional, in the past, in the present and in the future as well. So you never need to bother me again. Take it, you're forgiven. (laughs) So the Buddha was... So the Buddha just gave absolute forgiveness, past, present and future. Now again, whatever you do, it's okay. Now when the Buddha does that sort of loving kindness, the door of my heart's open to you. I mean that. I wish you well. When you have that degree of loving kindness, it becomes irresistible. You just, if you're a mad elephant, you just can't hurt someone like that. They're just too soft. They're just too lovable. They're just too mm, cuddly. <laughs> and so now they give you just, he just couldn't bring himself to trample on the Buddha or kill the Buddha. And because of that kindness, this his mind went just so soft. And he stopped in front of the Buddha. He put his head down and the Buddha just started stroking him on the trunk. There, Nalagiri, never mind. It's not your fault. Just someone gave you alcohol. It's okay, shh, you'll be okay. Now that's what I call the Nalagiri strategy. So what that means, if you've got a crazy mind, which is like a mad elephant, and some of you had the mad elephant crazy mind on this retreat. Don't fight it. Say, oh, crazy mind, that's okay. You're fine. The door of my heart's open to you, crazy mind. And if the more rampaging your mind is, the more you have to do the Nalagiri strategy. And if you let your mind be crazy like that, after a few seconds your mind is kneeling down in front of you, absolutely subdued, peaceful, kind, even getting close to jhana, their mind is okay. That is how you deal with a crazy mind, with kindness. The more you try and control it, the more energy you give it. So the more mad you are, the more you need kindness. What's wrong with being mad? That too is not part of the five precepts. We don't have madness, viramani, sikapa, (laughs) dhamsamadhi. So because of that, you know not to fight with ill will. Even restlessness. What happens when the mind is restless? Why is the mind restless? It's because you're not content with what you have. Thinking somewhere else would be something nice. It's like sometimes you look for the food. 
which you have at lunch or breakfast. You look at this. Maybe not that. Maybe have some of that. No, not some of that. Some of this. No, not some of this. Some of that. You look for what's on somebody else's plate. I'll have some of yours. <laughs> Restlessness is you're never content with what you have. You always want <laughs> Restlessness is you're never content with what you have. You always want something more. So, you have enough already. This is good enough. So, your little place where you're sitting, this is good enough. If you're content on your little cushion, then you'll find you don't want to move at all. Have you ever said thank you to your cushion for supporting your bottom all these hours? You've been kind to your... No wonder you get sore in the bottom because your cushion's getting its own back. Because you never said thank you. It's poking up here and poking up there. I'm going to teach that ungrateful meditator. <laughs> so be kind to your cushion. And then the cushion is kind to you. It's like contentment. Now when you're in your meditation, why is it that the mind moves somewhere else? You're not content to be here. You're always going somewhere else. You know, every so often, in each one of you, Janus has knocked at the door. But you've been out when it called. <laughs> and that's why it couldn't come in. You've been going somewhere else. You've never been here with what you're experiencing. That's why it never happened. So you're just content to be here. Okay, if I'm a restless mind, I'm not going to go anywhere else. I'm going to stay here. I'm not going to add restlessness to restlessness. If my mind is only starting present moment awareness, that's all I've got. That's good enough for me. You are someone who is easily satisfied. Those people who want something out of this meditation, who want to sit longer, sit deeper, you'll find that that wanting will create restlessness. You always want something more. Where can you ever rest? Is it going to be perfect when you can rest? One of the nice stories was of this monk called Buddha Dasa, a great monk. He was building his main meditation hall. When it came to the rainy season retreat, he stopped building. Sent all the builders home. This is time for meditation. Stop the building. Actually, it'd be great if they stopped the building upstairs because then bang, bang, bang. <laughs> but anyway, they stopped the building. A few days later, a man came to visit. And he looked at the hall. It hadn't got a roof on. There was pieces of wood all over the place. And so he asked the great monk, when is your hall going to be finished? And he said, the hall is finished. What do you mean, the hall is finished, said the visitor. There's not a roof on it yet. There's no windows in the, in the holes. There's not even any doors. It's a mess. Are you going to leave it like that? What do you mean, the hall's finished? And without missing a beat, this great monk said, What's done is finished. And then, he went the, <laughs> and then he went off to meditate. Isn't that a wonderful attitude in life? What's done is finished. So you don't have to always be doing things. At least some of life can be finished. Unfortunately though, I told that story many years ago at our temple in Perth on a Friday night. Really, it was just about meditation. The only time you get, have any peace in life is to say, what's done is finished, and leave it alone to rest. Because really, all your life is never finished, is it? All of your housework, all your women, it's never finished. As soon as you do all the dishes, your husband makes a cup of coffee and dirties another one. As soon as you sweep the ground, your children come in with their dirty shoes and make it filthy again. Oh, your, your husband, as soon as you paint one wall, another one gets dirty. Your work is never finished in life, is it? Even at work, as soon as you get one project out of the way, your boss gives you another one. Actually, it's usually before you finish the old one, he gives you another one. <laughs> usually another two sometimes. But the point is, how can you ever get any peace unless you understand the meaning of what's done is finished? What's done is finished, great, I can have a few minutes rest. However, I told this story on a Friday night 
on a Saturday, on a Sunday morning, there was a, a man came to complain to me. He was a Sri Lankan man. He told me, he said, Ajahn Brahm, never tell that story again, especially when there's children in the audience. Because apparently what happened on a Saturday evening, his 16-year-old son was about to go out to a party. And the father, this man, said, Son, have you done your homework? Because I told you you can't go out to the homework until you've done, you can't go out to the party until you've finished your homework. And as the boy was going out of the door, he said, Dad, just as Ajahn Brahm told us last night, what's done is finished. Good night. See you tomorrow. <laughs> so that does not apply to your children doing their homework. <laughs> it does apply to you. What's done is finished. Then we can't, don't get restless then. Otherwise, we've always got something to do when there's something to do, they'll always be doing and that's the cause of restlessness. So, what's done is finished. You've already completed the task by sitting down on your cushion. Now, relax, let go. Whatever happens is fine by me. You are content whatever comes. If it's enlightenment, you are content. If it's restlessness, you are content. If it's sleepiness, you are content. Whatever happens, you're at peace. Then you're never restless. You're happy where you are. When you're happy where you are, you don't go anywhere. That's the end of restlessness. You know you're not restless when you are still. You don't move because you're content to be here. And it's the same with life. Sometimes people have got a house. It's a wonderful house. They want to get another house, a bigger house. And then you get the bigger house and then you're content for a while. You get another bigger house. You're always moving. Why do people always move? Can't you be content with the house you've got? People are just so restless these days. Even worse, these days people get married and they're not content with the one they're married to, so they're restless. They go somewhere else. Get another wife. You know in Thailand, they call mistresses, they call small wives, or rather little wives. They call it mianoi, called little wives. And this scallywag man who had a couple of little wives sort of was a, uh, some of the, he's not supposed to be a Buddhist. Why are you getting all these mistresses, all these little wives? He said, because the Buddha told us to be content with little. <laughs> <laughs> oh, some people are just too smart for their own good. <laughs> Aren't you content with the one you've married? She's good enough. My goodness. And he, he's good enough. Can't you be content with them? If you're restless, you're discontent, you go for somebody else, you're not content with them, you go all around, you never rest, you never get any contentment. So the person you're with is good enough. Your kids, your children are good enough. Maybe they won't go to university, but they're good enough. They're happy. Your life is good enough. Have you got enough money yet? It's good enough. If I can be content with having nothing, surely you can be content with how much money you've got. How much money do you need? If I could give you each a million dollars, would that be enough? Maybe for five minutes. <laughs> Another million, please. The point, have you ever seen this? People who win lotteries, they buy the lottery ticket again next week. It's amazing because they got 20 million and they already spent it. <laughs> and they want another 20 million. There's never enough when you're restless. When you're restless, there's never any place you can find peace. When you're restless, there's never any person who's good enough for you. When you're restless, 
you are never good enough for you. It's one of the terrible diseases of life, restlessness. And all it needs to combat it is learning gratitude and appreciation. I look sometimes at my monastery in, in Australia. I look at all the things which need to be done. Look at all of the renovations, all the maintenance which needs to be done, all the leaves which need to be swept from the floor. And I think, oh my goodness, it's too much work. So I decide to do contentment instead. Instead, I look at all of the buildings which have already been finished. I look at all the maintenance which has been done. I look for all the leaves which have been swept away. And then I'm content. This is good enough. So all of you women, when you go back to your kitchen, don't look for all the dirty dishes in the sink. Look for all the clean dishes which are already <laughs> I think they're far more, that's good enough. So you can be content. <laughs> and then you're not restless, you can rest. It's good enough for now. You can wash them more, then you get dirty again later, so what's the point? <laughs> so, now this is not being lazy. This is learning how to take a rest, take a break. Have some peace in your life. Otherwise, when are you going to rest in peace? <laughs> you know the only people who rest in peace are in the cemetery. It's a bit late then. So rest in peace now by having some restless, having some restlessness, ness. Rest, ness, whatever it is. In other words, having some rest. End restlessness by contentment. And the last of these hindrances is like doubt. Is it this way, is it that way? Some of you have been meditating. Have I been hallucinating? Have I been dreaming? Or is it real? What's happening? Well, look, uh, have a bit of trust and a bit of faith. Look, well, I've come all the way from Perth to teach you. At least you can believe what I say half the time. It's half the time. I'll settle for 50%. Because people always have doubts. This monk says this, this monk says that. This teacher, this religion says this, this religion says that. Even your friend says one thing and another friend says another thing. It's so confusing life, isn't it? We don't know what to believe. It's easy to find out. Find out for yourself. At least trust this path enough to actually to follow it and see what happens. See what happens when you give up desire. See what happens when you give up your will. See what happens when you have you allow sleepiness to disappear by itself without fighting it. See what happens when you replace restlessness with just contentment. Easily contented, no matter what you're experiencing. See what happens just when you follow these teachings. I've been teaching a long time. I know this path because I walk the path. I'm not just a theoretical Buddhist. So, see what happens when you follow this path. You'll find that you get deeper, more peaceful, more mindful, Insights start to flow. You'll understand why I say you don't do insights, you don't do samatha, you don't do anything. You just get out of the way and the path happens. This is a great teaching of the Buddha. It's in the Anguttara Nikaya. It's a sutra which uh, one, as a Western monk, Western man, a professor translated it in one book, it's been translated several times, but he gave this beautiful title to this sutra. He said, Enlightenment is a natural process. This cause and effect. When you get one thing, he said, for example, you can start with happiness. Oh, let's start early. When you get tranquility, tranquility of the body, then happiness comes into the mind. You don't need to think or decide, oh, may I be happy. When you're tranquil, it happens as a natural, unavoidable um, consequence. Once you have happiness, sukha, inside the mind, you don't have to think or decide, oh, may I get jhanas. 
It happens as a natural consequence. You can't avoid it. It's nature that for one who is happy, the mind becomes concentrated. You don't have to think. You don't have to make a decision. Oh, may I see things as they truly are. Yata buddha yana dasana. It, in other words, you don't have to find insight. You don't have to do insight. It's a natural event that for one who has samadhi, that you see things as they truly are. You don't have to make an act of will. It happens naturally. And for those who see things as they truly are, who have insight, you don't need to make an act of will. You don't need to decide, oh, may I become enlightened. It happens naturally. It's an all a cause and effect process. And that's a beautiful teaching because it shows you how letting go happens. This wonderful eightfold path, once you get on that path, it goes all the way to the terminus, to Nibbana, and there's no stops on the way. You can't get off the bus even if you wanted to. You can ring the bell, but the driver will keep going on. I should have told you this before you joined the retreat, but most of you are already on the bus. It's too late. I'm sorry. (laughs) So it's great. It's a natural process. It's nothing to do with you. In fact, the quicker you get out of the way, the sooner you reach the goal. Try it out, and you'll find all your doubts disappear. It's a beautiful path. I remember my teacher Ajahn Chah, when I was a young monk, he gave this very profound teaching. And of course, being a young monk, I never understood it for many, many, many years. But when a great monk says these things, it's amazing how you remember them. Because you know that he doesn't say things lightly. He said, when I was first a monk in his monastery, Wat Ba Pong in Tainan, he said, it's becoming a monk is like going into an orchard, a mango orchard, when all the trees have been planted a long time ago. They're already tall and mature. Already the mangoes are on the end of the branches. All you need to do is sit under the mango tree and wait for the mango to fall. That's what he told us. And I thought, that doesn't make any sense. I've got to strive. I've got to spend hours and hours sitting in meditation. I've got to study. I've got to be mindful. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. Because I never understood what Ajahn Chah said. And of course, now you understand. The Buddha planted this beautiful mango orchard called the Dhamma. The mangoes are already on the tree. Truth, peace, enlightenment is right up there, right above you as you're sitting, where you're sitting. All you need to do is to be still enough to be peaceful enough, to let go of all these hindrances and make peace with every moment and then the mango of enlightenment will fall right into your palm. The orchard has already been planted. The fruit is already on the trees. All you need to do is to be still enough, to be patient enough and the mangoes will fall. And that's a wonderful place to end this talk. Thank you. Okay, any questions about this evening's talk? Or about anything else? Any questions? Yes, we've got a question. How do you deal with lack of discipline in practice? In the book, The Chinese Art of War. There was a general, I forget exactly what his name was, who had the best discipline in the whole imperial army. And the emperor was intrigued. What is your secret of such tremendous discipline? So he summoned this general and asked him in front of the court, you have got the best discipline in your troops, of my whole army, what is your secret? Why do your troops always do what they're told? And without missing a beat, the general said, the reason why my soldiers always do what they're told, why they follow orders, 
is because I only tell them to do what they want to do. <laughs> so that's how to get perfect discipline. Only tell yourself to do what you want to do. Then you'll always do it. <laughs> you understand? No, you don't. <laughs> because obviously there must be something more to it than that. Because how can you get soldiers to get up early in the morning? Because obviously there must be something more to it than that. Because how can you get soldiers to get up early in the morning? How can you get soldiers to train so hard? How can you get soldiers to charge into battle knowing that they might be wounded? Actually, they will be wounded and many of them will be killed. How can you get them to do that? Motivation. That general was brilliant at motivating his troops to see the benefits in actually getting up early in the morning. Actually to have like the, the feeling of um, pride, if you like, to be strong, to be a good soldier, to have the patriotism, to serve your country, to sacrifice yourself for a bigger cause, whatever it was. He was such a great motivator, they never needed to force his soldiers. They couldn't wait to get up in the morning. They couldn't wait to train. They were just waiting, wanting to get into battle. That's why when he gave them the orders, they were only doing what they really wanted to do. So, how you have discipline, whatever you tell yourself to do, want to do it. Motivate yourself. So those of you on retreat, we're getting up five o'clock tomorrow morning, want to get up in the morning. Think to yourself, one extra hour means, look, if, if you take one hour off your sleep every night, then that makes, if you say average eight hours of sleep, and they go down to seven hours of sleep, that's actually one twenty-fourth of your life extended. In 72 years, say, that's an extra three years on your life. And instead of adding on the end of your life, when it's pretty useless because you're so old you can't enjoy it anyway, you add that time and this part of your life. So one extra, one hour of your sleep is three extra years of life. Isn't that wonderful? So motivate yourself to get up early in the morning. You can catch up on your sleep when you're dead in your coffin. And, then, and this is a time you get enlightened. Isn't this wonderful? This is not like just getting up to go to work. This is getting up to stop all the work. And if you don't get up early tomorrow morning and get enlightened in this retreat, you're going to have to come back to life again and work and work and work for many, many lifetimes. So if you do it properly, get up early this morning, next morning, that can be the end of getting up forever. <laughs> get enlightened so you can see you motivate yourself and you've got to sit meditation how can I motivate myself to watch the breath the Buddha became enlightened watching the breath that was his method this is important if you watch the breath who knows just like the Buddha it could be your time Oh, I must get to my breath pretty quickly. This might be my day. Who knows? So you really want to watch the breath. You had, especially for those of you who have had any good meditation experiences, you have so much fun with your breath. It's like meeting an old friend. If I meet an old friend, I've had really a great time with them before, I forget what I'm supposed to do and I go and have a cup of coffee with them. It's like, it's nice hanging out with your old friends. It's like my breath is my old friend. I've had such a wonderful time with my old friend, the breath. So I hang out with it. How are you going, breath? We had a wonderful jhana the last time we met. Yeah, remember that one? Oh, that was a great one. Let's do it again. <laughs> so that it becomes natural. You don't need to discipline the mind because it's fun. When I was a school teacher, I was taught this in educational psychology. If you make your lesson fun, 
The children want to listen. If you make it fun, they want to do the task. If you make it boring, then of course no one wants to do it. If it's not fun, if it's not enjoyable, then the discipline is shot. That's why if you're trying to discipline your mind in meditation, you're not having fun, you're wasting your time. Make it fun in your meditation. That's why I said, do the breathing backwards. <laughs> Make it fun. I'm the only one who teaches breath meditation backwards. For those of you who haven't heard that before, you breathe out first and then you breathe in. <laughs> It's breathing backwards, because most people breathe in first and then they breathe out. Or sit in a different position. All of you sitting this way, sit the other way, face backwards. <laughs> Make it fun, enjoy yourself. See what happens next. <laughs> so, don't be a creature of habit, always doing things the same old way. That You die that way. The same with your relationships. You've been married a long time, you've got to be innovative. Do things differently. Even if it's sleep on the opposite side of the bed, instead of husband on this side, wife on that side, swap. Anything for a bit of innovation. Even, this is one of my ways of uh, waking up early in the morning. When you get up early in the morning, you brush your teeth, what side of the mouth do you start on? The left or the right? Upper gum or lower gum? Live on the wild side. Start on the opposite side of the mouth tomorrow morning. <laughs> what you're doing there is because you're doing it different, you're not a creature of habit, you do it the other side, you're more awake. When you go to work in the morning, don't always go on the same route. Go on a different route. It's amazing what you might find. Go, okay, you may be late, but you have more fun. <laughs> so, don't be a creature of habit. And then, Life becomes fun, it becomes interesting, and then you don't need discipline anymore. You do it because you want to, because life is fun. You enjoy doing it. You enjoy being a wife, you enjoy being a husband, you enjoy being a monk, you enjoy going to work. You may, even when you're sick, you enjoy being sick. I enjoy going to the dentist. I do, because... Those dentist chairs, we haven't got any chairs like that in my monastery. It's the most comfortable chair. I lay back. And the best thing about going to the dentist, they put all this stuff in the mouth. For once, no one can ask me a question. <laughs> it's the only peace I get going to the dentist. <laughs> so you look at the positive side. That's where you get all the discipline you ever want. Fun. So, make it that you want to do what you tell yourself to do. If you've got people working in your office to get good discipline, motivate them to want to do the task. And then they'll always do it. Don't try fear. Fear never works. Joy always works. Any other question? Yep, over there. Yes? Correct. Yep. Okay, you're talking about the role of mindfulness in the first jhana. The first jhana is a powerful state. It's not just the five hindrances have gone, but it's also the five senses have gone as well. You're just left with the mind. The body's disappeared. In the first jhana, you can't hear anything. You can't feel your body. If someone kicks you, you would not know it. It's happened many times. This is another story about one of, um, one of the disciples. He had terrible migraines when he was a young man. And he was actually in the British Army at this time. I think he was a warrant officer, so he was in charge of a group of soldiers. They were on manoeuvres in Germany, in West Germany. The order came through on the radio to stop and have a rest. At this particular time he had a terrible migraine, so he told his second in command, 
you look after the soldiers. He saw a barn. So I'm going to sit in that barn because it's dark and just try and get rid of my migraine. Because if you have migraines, in the dark places you feel much more comfortable. But how he dealt with his migraine was actually going deep inside the pain, as I was telling you before, and he could do it. He went so deep inside the pain he couldn't feel any pain at all. He didn't realize at the time that he was going into a jhana. Because what happened at this particular time, he said he can't do it now, but he used to do it when he was young. What happened next was the order came through the radio that the um, orders had been changed, pack up your things, start moving, they've got to go somewhere else. So all the soldiers packed up their stuff, got into their truck and were you know, a mile down the road when they realized they'd left this guy in the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the shed. So they went back and he was sitting in the shed, absolutely immobile, and they just lifted him up and dumped him in the truck. And they've seen him do this before. Now soldiers aren't the most gentle of people, but he hadn't got any knowledge at all that they were lifting him up and dumping in a truck. When he came out of his meditation, he said, just going inwards. He came out, he went you know, into this state in a barn, he came out in a truck. And he wondered, well, how the heck did I get in here? And the soldiers explained to him, all that time he couldn't feel a thing. He was perfectly aware, but deep inside, not outside. That's actually what happens with Ajahn. What the mindfulness is, is the mindfulness starts to get powerful and focused. We can have mindfulness about all sorts of things. It's both wide and moving very fast. Mindful of this, then mindful of that, then mindful of something else. Because it's always moving, it doesn't build up power. When it's still, you tend to see more things. What you see, as I was saying this the other day, it's like the, a photograph developing. Just when you first develop a photograph, the negative, whatever it is, the colors, first of all, are very dim and then they sort of come out more and more as the colors actually start to manifest on the photographic paper. That's how it works. And that's what mindfulness is like. If you're very still, the information starts to become richer and deeper and all the detail starts to happen. If you're moving, you just get a blur on the photograph. So when mindfulness becomes still, it becomes powerful and it goes inside, inside the center of things. So what happens when you are given up the five hindrances? The mindfulness is still. It doesn't desire anything, it doesn't uh, want anything, it's got no ill will, it's neither rejecting nor accepting, it's got no sloth and torpor, it's bright, it's not restless, it's not moving backwards and forwards and it's certain of what's happening. What happens if those five hindrances are overcome? That mindfulness solidifies and goes in, in, in. It goes into time into the present moment, it goes into the silence, it goes into the body, it goes into the mind. When it goes that far in, the mindfulness becomes superpowered mindfulness. If you know the mindfulness within a jhana, it's incredibly powerful, but still. Those five factors of jhana, I'll tell this later on, it's another talk later on about the jhanas. It's one factor of jhana but just with five aspects. What's actually happening there, the one-pointedness, everything is in one place. The other aspect, the Vitaka Vichara, is a wobble in the experience. The Piti Sukha is completely together. That is the object, that's what you're experiencing in the jhana. That's what you're mindful of. The mindfulness is of bliss. You're not mindful of the body, you're not mindful of sounds, you're not mindful of the breath, that's all been passed a long time ago. When you come out of those states, you say, what are you experiencing? There's only one word, bliss, ecstasy. That's the object. That's why it's the, it's the samadhi japiti sukha, the happiness born of samadhi. Is that a question? 
Okay. Okay. Yeah, I've got a, a thing here. The audience upstairs. Hi, upstairs. I'm, I'm waving. I've got a television there. If you have a question, you, if you can actually ask a question. Any questions upstairs? No. Can I get one question? Yeah, you're pointing at something. I can see you. Can you see me? Can you, I'm waving at you. Can you wave back? Yeah, thanks. <laughs> nice to be out there. You got a question? You can come to the microphone for a question. No, okay, no one's coming. Is there a question up there? No. Okay, a question from here then, downstairs. Yes. Oh, so did that answer your question about the jhanas? Okay, yes. Your question. Yes, that's me. Yeah, thank you. Is that the question? <laughs> okay, very good. I don't wear a dress. <laughs> yeah. Correct. <laughs> yeah, if you've got a very, very difficult boss, you should um, tell him to come and listen to one of Ajahn Brahm's lectures. <laughs> that actually happened. There was this one of the people who comes to my centre. He was again one of these Waisak Buddhists. He was a Sri Lankan man. He'd only come to the temple on Waisak. The rest of the time you wouldn't see him at all. He's like a Waisak Buddhist. It's just like a, a Christmas Christian who only goes to church on Christmas Day and the rest of the year <laughs> doesn't go at all. So this was a Waisak Buddhist and he was working for the Department, Department of Minerals and Energy in Western Australia. And he had a boss. He told me this story later. He had this boss he called like the boss from hell. But just like that boss, are always giving you so much work, being really demanding, being very, very obnoxious and even though he worked very hard to try and complete the projects if he did complete the projects on time the boss would think okay I can give him more to do and whenever um, he met the boss the boss was always angry demanding a terrible person to work with but it happened that the boss changed in the space of six months the boss changed from being a boss from hell to being a boss from heaven, being so kind, uh, understanding, not so demanding. And actually he said he could work even more and complete more for such a boss when he wasn't getting so upset. But he couldn't help but ask this Australian man, his boss, you've changed, he said, six months ago, if you don't mind me saying, it was just so awful working for you. But now... You're so kind, you're so understanding. What's changed you? And the boss, this Australian man, said, I've found this wonderful Buddhist center in Perth. And I've been listening to Ajahn Brahm and had all these wonderful talks. And this Sri Lanka man said, That's my temple. <laughs> but he'd only go there once a year. And now he comes there every week. When he saw the result of the boss from hell, how good attitudes, kindness, letting go, actually encourages more work. You get more from your, your workers when you're kind, encouraging. I've got a little article on the wall which was uh, from the UK Engineering Review where they're giving prizes for innovation in engineering companies. And the company which won the award was a company which banned overtime in the company. They made it sort of company policy, you can only work 45 hours and it's company policy, absolutely 100%, you can't work more than that. That company, before they initiated that policy, had a huge turnover of staff 
people were burning out, getting so upset, they were leaving. The customer um, satisfaction was very, very low. Once they stopped overtime, the staff wanted to stay. Their experience was to the company's advantage. They actually worked harder. They cared for the company because the company cared for them. Their profits doubled. Because they're banned over time. They cared. It is good company policy to care for your workers. If you care for the workers, the workers will care for your staff, for your customers. It just makes so much sense. Even to the point, some years ago, there was, when I was in Thailand, and the in-flight magazine of Thai Airways, I got a, co- no, it wasn't the in-flight magazine, it was in Bangkok Post, sorry. There was an article about the Oriental Hotel in Bangkok. Probably the most famous hotel in Bangkok. It was not five stars, six or seven, like equivalent to the raffles in Singapore. The Oriental Hotel. It had just won a prize that year of the best hotel in the world. It beat everybody. Now that takes a lot to get the top hotel in the world. And they're interviewing the manager. What are your secrets? Why was it the best hotel in the world? He said, one of the things we've done over the last few years, we send all our employees, from the concierge to the chefs to the, the, uh, the cleaners, we send all of our employees in a rot- rotation to a Buddhist monastery for a meditation retreat for one week. At the company's expense, we don't take this time off their holidays. The Oriental Hotel was sending all of their workers for meditation retreat. And the interviewer, I think it was a Christian, said, are you trying to evangelize? Are you trying to make all your workers Buddhist? He said, no, it's nothing to do with that. It's just plain good business sense. We're in the hospitality industry. After the meditation retreat, I find my workers do not take so much sick leave. They're in good health. They're more sensitive because of the mindfulness which they develop. They're more sensitive to our clientele. And they have bigger smiles on their face. And that's hospitality. People like coming to our hotel. It's good business sense, he said. And that's why it got the best hotel of the year. So, when you go back to your company, you tell them, you should send everyone to a retreat under Ajahn Brahm at the company's expense. <laughs> Every year, and then your company would also get the Company of the Year award. Wouldn't that be great? And they pay you to come as well. That'd be even better. <laughs> and that was true. So this is actually, the, if you've got the boss from hell, send them to someone like, like me, or give them some Dharma tapes. It's not in their interest to do things like that. Any other question? And if you've got, you children, if you've got the mother and father from hell, they always say, do more homework, do more homework, come on! Then you take them to say, Daddy, Mummy, can we go and see Ajahn Brahm tonight? <laughs> and then your Mummy and Daddy from hell will become your Mummy and Daddy from heaven. And then because you've got such kind parents, you'd actually want to work harder and do more homework. Not because of fear, because of encouragement. Yeah, question, yes. Hi. Can you repeat that? How do you set ourselves? Free from hatred. Okay, look. If, why do you hate anyway? Because it's only because someone's upset you and they've upset you, they said something, they've done something in order to, to spoil your happiness. So why are you doing what they want you to do? They've said this terrible thing or they've done this awful thing to make you upset. And I would never do that. If someone calls me camel face 
I'm not going to allow them to spoil my day. <laughs> Never let anybody control your happiness. They can say whatever they like, they can do whatever they like. I'm going to be happy in spite of what you do or what you say. Your happiness is your concern. If you hate somebody, you've lost the argument. You're a loser. So instead of hating, I just ignore. If, say in your relationship, your partner says these stupid things, sometimes they say those things to wind you up, to get a reaction, a negative reaction. Just ignore those stupid statements. If you ignore them, you don't even get upset, you don't acknowledge them, you don't argue, they call you camel face. I don't hear that. After a while, they'll stop saying it because they get no reaction. But if they say nice things, oh, you're just a beautiful girl, you're so nice you know, living with you, you're so kind, acknowledge that. Say, oh, thank you so much. Give them a hug, give them a kiss. You're so kind too. Because what you acknowledge, you reinforce. What you ignore, you suppress. This is how we actually control others, how we actually help them. Look, there was this one monk years ago who was such an angry monk. I found out later it was because he had migraines. That's actually why he got angry at everybody. And one day he got angry at me. What I was doing, I was washing my bowl after the meal and I was washing the little spittoon we used to have as well. And he came up to me and he looked at me and he said, Bamawangso, that's a filthy habit. But worse than that, I'm trying my best to be angry, but I'm not really used to it. Brahma Angsa, that's a filthy habit. <laughs> and everybody stopped. Because when you have, like, conf it's very boring in a monastery. When you have, like, an argument like this, it's really exciting. <laughs> so everybody stopped. And of course, my first reaction was to look, well, I'm, what am I doing? I said, I've been doing this for, year, for, for months. Everyone else does the same. Why pick on me? Whenever someone shouts you like that, the first thing which comes up is self-justification. Why me? This is not fair. But at least I was wise enough to not go down that road. If I'd have stood up and say, you can't say that to me. Everyone else is doing this. Stop getting angry like this. I'd have just fed his anger. I'd have got angry myself. So instead, I used all of my willpower, I looked him up and I said, sorry. And then I turned around, and again I was shaking with actually control. Because I didn't want to do this, I was going against my grain, I should have stood up to him, but um, what I did was much better. I went to the rag box, picked up the rag, and as I was going to that rag box, I saw all the other monks, they'd stopped washing their bowls, they were watching me. All the eyes were following me to the rag box. Now, is he going to get that rag box and tip it over this monk's head? What's he going to do? And I picked up a rag and I walked back and they followed me back. And I started doing exactly what he said, was wiping the spittoon with a rag. And then I looked up at him and everyone looked at him. He went beet red. He turned around and he went off. He tried to get me upset. I refused to get upset. And because of that, he never got angry at me ever again. He gets angry at other monks, but I'm one of his best friends. <laughs> and it was, I was very proud, and it was a very brilliant strategy. He got angry at me to try and embarrass me, to try and hurt me, and I refused to get hurt. Afterwards, he said, getting angry at Ajahn Brahm is like getting angry at a mountain. It's a waste of time, you waste of breath, you just get hoarse. Now if you can do that, people don't get angry at you anymore. It's a waste of time getting angry at you. And it means you don't hate anybody. When you hate someone, you just got this terrible pain inside. It's burning. It separates you from other people. And one thing you can always notice, the people you hate, other people love them. It's strange, it was strange to me when I was a young man, 
How can anybody love such a B-A-S, you know, you know the rest of the word. <laughs> but they could. Because when I hate them, I could only see half of them, or part of them. And other people could see the other part of them. A part you can really love. Everybody who's the object of your hatred, you've got many, many friends who think they're wonderful. So the next time you hate someone, see what the other people see in them, their beautiful part. See their Buddha nature. When you see the Buddha nature in them, then you can forgive them. The first part of forgiveness is to see something in the person you hate which is worthy of forgiveness. If Mr. Bush could see something in Osama bin Laden which is worthy of forgiveness, then it would be the end of the problem. But sometimes we demonize people and think they're all bad, there's nothing redeeming in them. Now in Buddhism everybody has got Buddha nature. Everybody can be forgiven. And it's a much more beautiful world when we have forgiveness rather than hate. So free yourself of hate. If you think that person doesn't deserve to be forgiven, if you think they need to be punished, you do not need to be the punisher. You do not need to be the executioner. The punishment will come by itself. If you're a Christian, God will settle matters. If you're a Muslim, Allah, he will punish. If you're a Buddhist, karma will deal with it. A Hindu, if they've done something bad, they have to suffer because of karma. And if you don't believe in any religion, if you believe in psychology instead, you will know for what they did to you, they will have to go through years of expensive psychotherapy. <laughs> Whatever, no one gets away with anything. So you don't need to hate somebody. Forgive. In other words, you don't actually approve of what they did. But you let it go and it becomes freedom. Hatred is not a good response. It just burns us. It creates so much emotional turmoil. Whatever someone has done, if they've done something really awful, terrible, unconscionable to you. It's their problem. Don't suffer from their misdeeds. That's really unfair. Don't take on their karma. You've got enough good <laughs> karma for yourself. So there you let it go. Okay, any other questions before we finish tonight? Yes, one more from over there. Make this a last question. Okay, you're asking what triggers the first jhana, what's the cause? To find out the answer to that, come on, is it Wednesday night? Here we go. That will be answered on Wednesday night, coming soon. Who knows what's going to happen, so please come then. Just like when I was a kid, you used to go to the movies. You used to have this series of Batman, and at the very end, you didn't know what was going to happen next, so you had to come next week to find out. So, come next Wednesday and you'll find out what's going to happen when John Jardis. <laughs> so, thank you all for coming and thank you for those questions. May you have a wonderful night. Let's give, uh, what's it, the um, sharing of merits to all, because listening to the Dharma is one of the most wonderful things you can do. It's great merit, great good karma. Let's share the merits with all sentient beings. We're doing Idang May. Idam me nyati nang ho tu sukita hon tu yata yo. Idam me nyati nang ho tu sukita hon tu yata yo. Idam me nyati nang Ho tu sukita hon tu yata yo sadhu sadhu sadhu. Okay, the talk tomorrow night is letting go of letting go. That sounds a good one. And the th uh, Wednesday night is about the jhanas. And Thursday is life is not what it seems. That's interesting. 
And Friday, no one at home. I don't think I'll be here to give that talk. <laughs> and the last of all, Saturday the 25th. The end of the journey, enlightenment, will be explained on Saturday the 25th. So please uh, tell all your friends, and even more importantly, tell your enemies, because they need it more than your friends. <laughs> and I'll see you tomorrow or the next days. Take care. Bye-bye.